This is FCN Frontline Report with Brenda Hines. Hello everyone, I'm Brenda Hines and this is FCN's Frontline Report brought to you by Ford Education and Training. In a brief roundup of industry news, the new Honda Sport Utility Vehicle finally has a name, the Honda Passport. The vehicle built by Isuzu is a clone of the current Isuzu Rodeo. Meanwhile, Hyundai has announced it will increase prices of its 1994 models an average of 3%. The base price of its subcompact Excel will be almost $7,200, while prices of the 94 midsize Sonata will range from about $12,800 to about $15,700 for the V6-powered GLS model. Newly released surveys by the U.S. Commerce Department and the American Automobile Manufacturers Association reveal that the price gap between domestic and imported cars is continuing to widen. In the second quarter, domestic car sales transactions averaged $17,275, while the average import left the showroom for $20,589. That's a gap of more than $3,300. Most of that is attributed to the rising yen and the increasing popularity of preferred equipment package programs. As a group, U.S. automakers will be taking advantage of that gap by increasing fourth quarter production by an average of almost 13 percent. Ford Motor Company is slated to increase car production by 14.1 percent and truck production by more than 17.6 percent. And finally, Automotive News Magazine has just reported on a new survey of what today's customers want from an automobile dealership. According to the survey, here are the top five things the customers say they'd like their dealership to provide. Number one, a record that would show the history of a used vehicle. Second, a well-stocked parts department. Third, trained and certified sales consultants. In fourth place was a large selection of new and used vehicles, and in fifth place was adequate parking. We'll have more on that survey, including a look at what customers want from dealership sales consultants in the next Frontline program. Now turning to the major product news from the industry, Ford is less than 60 days away from the eagerly awaited introduction of the all-new 1994 Ford Mustang. In today's report, FCN's John Fawson examines who the company expects the primary Mustang customers will be. The new Mustang is expected to appeal mainly to five customer groups. The base coupe, equipped with a V6 engine, should attract two types of customers. One type is young single females who want an affordable, sporty car. These young women most likely are on a tight budget and possibly working their first full-time job. The other primary buyers for the base coupe are expected to be young families who are seeking a second or third car. Although both spouses work, men will probably make the purchase. The V8-powered Mustang GT is targeted at the young single male who is looking for an affordable, high-performance, sporty car. This customer is quite knowledgeable about vehicle specifications and the competition. The Mustang convertible should appeal to two main customer groups. One group is mature, married, empty nesters who are looking to purchase an additional car. These buyers are expected to have college educations and dual incomes. It's anticipated the other convertible customer group will consist of young, affluent, single individuals who want an attractive, sporty car. Most of these buyers will probably be men. But one thing that is common to all these groups is th that the automobile itself is an expression of their lifestyle and it's also a reflection of their own image. Based on early customer and dealer reaction, the company expects to sell every 1994 Mustang it can make. Mustang will be the first of three all-new products Ford will be launching in 1994. It will be followed by a new entry-level vehicle called the Aspire and a new front-wheel drive minivan called the Windstar. Chrysler will also be launching a new subcompact in 1994, the Neon. In fact, they've moved up their job one from November 29th to November 1st. The Neon, which will be marketed by both Dodge and Plymouth, is Chrysler's first subcompact entry in almost a decade. Although the sedan won't be available in dealer showrooms until January, FCN's Rob Marr gives us a sneak preview of the new competitor. The Neon is the first subcompact car to adopt Chrysler's new cab-forward design. The car was derived from a highly acclaimed concept car introduced at the 1991 Detroit International Auto Show. 
A four-door sedan will be produced beginning November 1st at Chrysler's Belvedere, Illinois assembly plant. Next September, a two-door version will be built in Mexico. With the Neon, we're convinced that we're going to make small cars a whole new game. We'll enable the Neon to reach a whole new generation of buyers. Since the car does not go public until after the first of the year, Chrysler is not talking about price yet. Uh, we're going to be very, very competitive with the best of the domestics from a price standpoint, and we would expect to be at least a couple of thousand dollars less than the Japanese. Advertising for the Dodge and Plymouth Neon will be done on Winter Olympic and Super Bowl telecasts. I'm Rob Marr, FCN News. In addition to the Neon, Chrysler is banking heavily on the launch of its new full-size pickup, the Dodge Ram. That's apt to be a tough assignment. Right now, the Ford F-Series is outselling the current Dodge entry by about 7 to 1. Here's Rob again with a look at the size of the task facing the new Ram truck. Dodge has been selling about 80,000 full-size trucks a year for a 6% share of the market, but plans on selling an additional 80,000 trucks in 1994. Chrysler expects most of the increased Ram sales to come at the expense of the F-Series and the Chevy CK. The F-Series offers such models as regular cabs, super cabs, crew cabs, chassis cabs, super duties, flare sides, and lightnings. The Ram comes in just regular cab and chassis cab models. Model availability is key to capturing important fleet business. They need super cabs and crew cabs uh, to take out to the job and to also have the regular cabs, so Dodge cannot be a, will not be able to be a full fleet competitor. Although the Dodge Ram regular cab has more space behind the front seat than the Ford regular cab, F-Series offers a roomier alternative. We have a super cab that the real customer who wants that extra versatility, we can move them into a super cab. Uh, not only will they have four or five, I believe they'll have 22 inches of rear seat, rear space, plus a seat in the back for the added versatility of hauling or carrying more people. The 94 F-Series also has an engine lineup with more overall torque, more advanced transmissions, and greater maximum payloads in most model comparisons than the Dodge Ram. I'm Rob Marr reporting for FCN News. You can find more detailed information on the Dodge Ram versus the F-Series in the Education and Training Department Hot Sheet, which should be in your dealership now. There is also a video competitive comparison between the F-Series, the Dodge Ram, and the Chevy CK. Now, speaking of the CK, it will be going into the 1994 model year with a decided disadvantage. The CK will not be offering a driver's side airbag, a feature which will now be standard equipment on the new F-Series. In fact, four of Ford's truck lines and all of its cars will feature airbags in 1994. Ford is also moving ahead on other safety features during the new model year. For example, the company will be installing energy-absorbing foam bolsters into door panels a year earlier than scheduled. The Utica trim plant is already producing the foam safety bolsters for the 1994 Ford Mustang, Thunderbird, and Mercury Cougar. The federal government requires all automakers to install bolsters into the doors of the 1995 models, but Ford decided to launch the component a year in advance. We've got, uh, we've got about a, a total uh, $14 million project uh, tooling and facilities. Uh, to manufacture uh, approximately uh, uh, 16 million of these parts a year. So it's uh, quite an undertaking here at Utica. The foam bolsters are designed to cushion and absorb a side impact collision at 35 miles an hour. And there's more good news for Ford customers. According to the company's new vehicle quality study, many of the company's cars and trucks are already close to meeting the 1995 Ford Motor Company standards for vehicle quality. The company scored some notable successes in new product launches. The new Villager minivan scored a 90% customer satisfaction rating at three months of ownership. The new Mark 8 and the Ranger had higher quality than their predecessors. And the new Ranger Splash had the fewest quality problems of all Ranger models with 86% customer satisfaction. The whole system, both the manufacturing and assembly, has done a very, very good job in uh, reducing variability in manufacturing. And uh, we're quite proud of that. And, and I think what it says really is that uh, based on our 93 performance, there's uh, very little risk in buying a new product from Ford. 
The New Vehicle Quality Survey, or NVQ, is based on a 190-item questionnaire sent to owners of Ford vehicles after three months of ownership. The results are based on 20,000 responses. Third quarter results show Ford's quality level improved 5% over a strong third quarter improvement last year. In customer satisfaction, 82% of Ford owners say they're completely or very satisfied with their new cars and trucks. The company's standard is to reach 90% customer satisfaction at three months of ownership. Where we have vehicles with two things gone wrong or less or zero, customer satisfaction with those vehicles are very close to the imperative. They're running in a high 80s and in some cases low 90s. Likewise with uh, truck. Reviewing specific vehicle results, cars with year-to-year -year quality improvements include the Mark 8 with a 50% improvement over its predecessor. Also Mustang, Taurus and Sable, Continental, Tempo and Topaz, Town Car, Crown Victoria and Grand Marquis. All of Ford trucks except the Bronco showed improvement qualities for the third quarter of 1993. In a related quality story, Ford's customer service division is also reporting progress with a program designed to provide quicker feedback about problems with current models. Here's FCN's Cheryl Kane with that story. When dealer service technicians find problems in new vehicles during repairs, a new computer-driven system allows dealers to get information back to the company more quickly than in the past. That means any necessary changes can be made more quickly to the vehicle during the assembly process. Heretofore, it used to take seven or eight months until the warranty data filtered in. Now they have a process with selected dealers around the country on vehicles that report, and we get the information in a week. Wagner says the new system reduces warranty costs and improves customer satisfaction. So it pays off for the company, the dealer, and the customer. I'm Cheryl Kane for FCN News. And finally, this story. If you've been watching television this fall, you've probably seen a brand new commercial from Ford's customer service division. As FCN's Lauren Sides reports, it's part of a first ever ad campaign that emphasizes Ford dealership service. It's a level of care you won't find anywhere but at your Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealer. Everything from Naturally, the customer service ads reach out to consumers, but they're not the only target. What was even more important, our dealers viewed it to be a, a strong reinforcement from the company. These are the first televised customer service ads in the company's history, and they're supplemented by a major print campaign in leading magazines. Two TV ads already airing focus on trained technicians and the proper equipment they use to service cars. This ad stresses preventive maintenance. We need to enhance the image of our dealers because it is, is in fact a good place to have your car serviced. Quick, expert, and competitively priced. The theme, Quality Care, where the quality continues, builds a bridge between Ford's Quality is Job One campaign and the after-sale care dealers provide. If they are pleased not only with their vehicle, but the service, then we have a greater opportunity for that uh, next buying decision. And that's the bottom line for any advertising campaign. I'm Lauren Sides, reporting for FCN News. Along with developing the new campaign, Ford Customer Service has doubled its advertising budget from previous years. Ford has also increased its advertising budget to capture more Hispanic customers. The Hispanic market is now the fastest growing market in the U.S. Because Ford has been losing market share in that area, a company-wide effort is underway to turn that situation around. We'll have a special report on the Hispanic market following Frontline. It's full of information that all sales consultants can use on a day-to-day -day basis. You'll also be getting some print materials later this fall. So keep your eyes open for Education and Training's booklet called Earning Your Share of America's Fastest Growing Market, the Hispanic Community. Here at Frontline, we're also trying to expand our services to you. This month, we're introducing a little newsletter that accompanies this program. It's called Between the Lines, and in it, you'll find a synopsis of current news stories about our industry. Between the Lines is an experiment. The last thing we want to do is push more paper at you. So please let us know if you think it's helpful or how we can make it better. And if you come across a story you think would be of interest to other Ford sales consultants around the country, please fax it to us. Our fax number here is area code 313-446-4597. 
And that's it for this edition of Frontline Report. We hope this program has been helpful and that you'll continue to use the response cards to let us know how we can make it better. Again, stick around for our special report on the Hispanic market immediately following this program. On behalf of Ford Education and Training and the FCN Frontline staff, I'm Brenda Hines. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Midway Ford in Miami, where one weekend every month life is a carnival or a circus or some other family style event. The community Midway serves is 80 to 90 percent Hispanic and doing things together as a family is deeply important to these people. There are many other important things to know about the Hispanic community in this country but perhaps the most significant is that right now about 25 million Hispanics call the U.S. home and it's the fastest growing ethnic market in America today. Hispanics not only make up 10 percent of this country's population, they live in virtually every metropolitan area with the highest concentrations being in California, Texas, Florida, New York and Illinois and half of the American Hispanic population lives in suburban areas where the median income is twenty seven thousand dollars. Hispanics also generate fifteen billion dollars in revenue a year through the purchase of new and used vehicles. With those impressive statistics it's not hard to see why it's in everyone's interest to capture this valuable and potentially very profitable market. But while the Hispanic market has been expanding and continues to grow, Ford's market share in this arena has been shrinking. To better understand why, the company recently conducted a major research project in heavily populated Hispanic communities. Well, what we found from doing all of the market research and in discussions in the field with the dealers and with salespeople, Hispanics are telling us that for the most part, Nobody, no automotive manufacturer is really making a concerted effort to try to zero in on the Hispanic population and to be their car company. Ford's response was to establish a multifaceted company-wide marketing strategy with one common goal, to become the number one car supplier to the Hispanic population. To help you gain some insight into this coveted market, we'll share research results with you, and you'll hear from Hispanics themselves about what's important to them. We'll also visit some very successful dealerships like Midway Ford who cater to this group and find out what they're doing to better identify the needs of their Hispanic customers. But first, what exactly does the word Hispanic mean? Well, it's an ethnic classification, not a racial one. And it refers to U.S. citizens or residents who trace their origins back to Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Central or South America, and to more than a dozen other countries. While there is great diversity within the Hispanic culture, there are many common threads that run through it. For instance, when it comes to purchasing vehicles, Hispanics basically want the same things as most Americans. Something that is uh, reliable in the market that is known to be a good product. Safety, very important. No matter how old the person that is driving is. The first thing I look for is comfort, economy, and above all, a good warranty. I look for best quality. While Hispanics may want the same things most Americans want, there are some general cultural differences which affect the buying process. Ford's research basically mirrors the following observations. The Anglo is looking for price. The Spanish people look for salesperson. The people is, is different. When you see a Hispanic, is try to make them feel at home, try to make them feel comfortable. This may apply to everybody, but in Hispanics, it is a, I mean, vital. The main difference in serving the Hispanic customer versus the Anglo customer, I think, is uh, they have a lot of traditions. They have a lot of, uh, of spark as far as they like to be the main attraction when they come in. It's harder to sell to an Anglo customer because they are pickier. They ask for more price reductions and they look at details more. They're a little colder than Hispanic customers because they live in a first world country. 
Hispanics mostly live in third world countries and they're friendlier and they're not as detailed. They like something and they just buy it. We are different on the, on the other part of the Latin community. Why? Because we raise in different way. But basically we have one way to go. The one way to go is care about me, care about the customer. You know, how, how you, I can do that? The only way you can do this is to be friendly. They don't really like the uh, fast track uh, closing techniques uh, that we normally are uh, used to seeing in other dealerships. They want to feel like they, they trust the people they do business with. We ask Hispanic residents why they bought at a particular dealership and what it takes for them to become a repeat customer. He went out of his way to try and find the car that I wanted, that I needed, and something within the, you know, what I could afford. My husband goes to one because they are friendly, courteous, they treat you well and they respect you, and they give customers good service. If they treat me good, I, I'm coming back, that's for sure. The fact that they give you good service the first time when you buy the car, it makes you go right back, to even to the same salesperson, to give him the business. With Hispanics, you can't overestimate the value of word of mouth. While they may view a deal with skepticism at first, once a relationship and credibility are established, they tend to be fiercely loyal customers. A partner of mine, a friend of mine, he bought it. He bought a car there. He told me, go, and he even told me the salesman, he says, go talk to so-and-so. And he goes, and when you talk to him, he's going to be straight with you, he's going to be honest, he's going to tell you the way it is. And it was just like word of mouth. And then after I got it, my, uh, man, I think about three or four of my friends went, they got down, they, they went and got some payments, and they did it too. It's a type of customer that when they, they go to a dealership and they do business with them and they're treated uh, fairly and uh, they're given uh, a good deal, they'll come back and do business with you again and again for years. Uh, they, they like to go back to the same places. They like to do business with people they trust and people they like. The families tend to be bigger. And with bigger families, if you do treat them well, then you end up selling more people. It's that simple. What makes me loyal is the sincerity of the salesperson and the way I'm treated. That will make me go back to the same dealership. Overall, Hispanics place a lot of importance on education and family accomplishments. They tend to have traditional values and are family-oriented. In fact, it's not uncommon to involve family and friends in the buying and decision-making process. I go with my family so we can all agree to see if we all like what we're buying. I'm going to take someone with me. It's better between two people. If I don't understand, the other person may. In general, Hispanics make like, a, like an Indian powwow, I would say, to have everybody's opinion before they make any kind of a major decision. It's important that when we have that type of a situation, anybody that is going to deal with the Hispanic market uh, doesn't turn anybody off in the family because you turn off one member and you may have just lost the sale. Sometimes when they come in to buy a car, most of the times they come in groups. And I mean, you see seven or eight people and it's only one who's going to buy a car. And they all got something to say in making the decision of buying that car. But that helps a lot. Because if you treat them good, more likely, the other ones that came in with them, they're going to keep buying cars from you. Certainly a family-friendly atmosphere can be very helpful. Both Downey Ford in L.A. and Gus Machado Ford in Miami have successfully achieved that. But at Midway Ford in Miami, they've taken the concept a step further. In order to be viewed as an integral part of their community, Midway began holding special events every month and everyone is invited. We started with a circus. This was an experience because we figured we're going to get some people. Uh, bringing elephants out of here, camels, tigers, lions. Everybody said, you guys are crazy. Well, it turned out to be that we had over a thousand people each day. We sold over a hundred units in two days. Obviously, understanding the Hispanic culture is a critical factor in conquering the market. But what about the language barrier? Both Gus Machado and Midway Ford are located in areas that are 80 to 90 percent Spanish. They both feel it's very important for them to have bilingual salespeople, but they don't think it would be critical everywhere. It's really not necessary for a uh, salesperson to be bilingual to cater to the Spanish community. Uh, most Hispanics in this country speak English. Uh, fluently and uh, they don't have any problems communicating with uh, an Anglo to do business. You have to work it out a little bit more. It's not that hard, 
you have to work a little bit more and then trying to understand it. As soon as you understand the customer, the sales is yours. You don't care if you're Anglo, you are African. The community surrounding Downey Ford in L.A. is about 50% Anglo and 50% Hispanic. As a result, we can't ignore one part of the market uh, in favor of the other because we're not going to sell enough cars, we're not going to eat if we don't do that. So sales consultants here familiarize themselves with both cultures. There are bilingual consultants to deal with non-English speaking customers, but non-Spanish speaking salespeople often conduct business with Hispanic customers as well. Mike Bennett, who is not bilingual, says he's doing just fine. The Spanish speaking customers are pretty much the same. Actually, it's, it's, they make it easier on you because they come into the dealership and they don't shop around a lot. They find something they like, they just go ahead and go ahead and buy it. And, you know, they give you the chance right there on the spot to make them a deal. Like most American customers, Hispanics want to finance purchases. Obtaining credit can be a major concern, especially if that person has recently arrived in the U.S. Dealers and sales consultants may have to work with non-traditional credit histories and references to qualify a buyer. But for those with patience, it's time well spent. Being in, in Miami, uh, we deal with this on a daily basis. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a, a branch, a Ford Motor Credit branch, uh, that deals with this problem on a, on a daily basis. And what we try to do is we try to go, go back to their roots, in other words, go back to where they came from. Give the bank more information on what they did in, in their country, and that can help a bank make a decision if you were in a good position in your country, more likely you were going to do good here. What we try and do is to give more information to the credit company than what is actually required on a credit application. We try and give them more references than just two or three if that's what's called for in the credit application. We'll give them ten references. We'll supply them with phone bills, rent receipts, uh, mortgage statements, uh, more family members. We'll try and show that different people in the household work different jobs and they all are going to be using one car. And the car may be registered to the head of the household and he's responsible for it, he's responsible for insuring it, but everybody pitches in to pay for it. And the acid test that we use is that if the, if the guy has decent credit, but his income is low, there's got to be a way that he's making the payment. And it isn't that he's doing anything illegal, it's just the fact that he, it's non-traditional, it's something new. So we have to really emphasize that with the credit company when we call in the, the loan. Patience, persistence, and educating ourselves are always important in winning any market. And the Hispanic market is no exception. That's something for everyone to remember. From marketing, merchandising, advertising, field operations, public affairs, credit, education and training, dealers and sales consultants. In every market today in the United States, you have uh, Hispanics. Or they could be Mexicans, they could be Puerto Ricans, they could be from Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, any country in Central and South America. I think it'd be real easy for a dealer to ignore this particular group if it's not a big part of his workforce or part of his clientele today. I guarantee it's getting bigger, so you, you ignore it at your own risk.